One of the things that makes ion drives so powerful is they have the most effective use of fuel. And in space, there's no friction. There's nothing to slow you down. And so all the energy used to accelerate these ions can go into forward velocity. And you can just keep, over huge periods of time, accelerating and accelerating and accelerating. Traditional chemical rockets burn fast, loud, and hot. Ion propulsion systems, on the other hand, are in it for the long haul. So ion drives are both science fiction and, today, science fact. Between space probes headed out of our solar system and TV and radio waves, which have already left, humans have announced their presence to the universe. We have sent out missions with records containing the sounds of laughter and the beating of a heart, with anatomical diagrams of men and women. These are physical ambassadors that we've sent out among the stars. Carl Sagan asked the question many years ago, who speaks for Earth? Well, ultimately, I guess we all speak for Earth. And I wish we had been a little more circumspect or a little more thoughtful about the kinds of messages and ideas we're sending out into space with our radio and television programs. So far, our broadcasts have gone unanswered. But what if that changes? Science fiction is filled with tales of what happens when aliens arrive among us. I think we're going to find life out there, definitely. And if that happens, do we stand any chance? Or are we destined to be wiped from existence, exterminated by an advanced alien intellect? They say they come in peace. They leave our planet in pieces. Since the earliest science fiction stories, some themes have recurred with remarkable frequency. Perhaps none so much as this one. Alien invasions. Alien hordes arriving at the Earth and wreaking havoc. Just from a dramatic point of view, that's inherently more interesting than friendly aliens coming and solving all of our problems for us. Things started with H.G. Wells and the War of the Worlds. And he wrote that novel as a kind of criticism of British colonialism at the time. The movie District 9 takes a look at how humanity is inherently suspicious and inherently, in many ways, racist against the things that we don't understand. And aliens, well, what do we not understand as much as we don't understand life on other worlds? Astronomers have long been trying to determine if there's a plausible scientific way to answer the age-old question, are we alone? How common is intelligent life in the universe? The Fermi paradox, named for a question first posed by physicist Enrico Fermi, attempts to illuminate a conundrum about extraterrestrial life. intelligent life in the universe is common, then where are they? Well, if they're not here, probably not anywhere. So I think either we're unique, which is in and of itself kind of astonishing, or intelligent life like us is just not that common. Well, the question can be reversed. Why haven't they detected us? And we understand that fairly well. What would broadcast our existence to the rest of the universe is our radio emissions. And we've really been broadcasting in any reasonable amount since about the 1920s. So that means that our emissions, which radiate outwards at the speed of light, have reached about 90 light years. So we have a sphere of 90 light years in radius of planets and stars, civilizations that could detect us. That's not very big. Our galaxy is 100,000 light years from end to end. So if there were hundreds, thousands of civilizations out there, it might be that only one or two have been able to detect us in the time we've been broadcasting. And they may not have had time to send a hello message back. 
Another possible problem, loss of signal. As radio waves spread out from Earth, they fall off in intensity, eventually blending into the cosmic background. If someone on another planet is going to hear our transmissions, they might have to be relatively close. So how many civilizations might be tuning in to our radio shows and reruns? That's a question astronomer Frank Drake famously tried to answer. About 50 years ago, Frank Drake, a radio astronomer, was considering the possibility for life in the universe, and he launched the first SETI program, the first attempt to use a radio telescope to listen for signals from other stars. So Drake was wondering, well, what are my chances of success here? How many civilizations might there be in our galaxy? So, like any good astronomer, he did a little back-of-the-envelope calculation, and he created an equation that basically said, all right, here's how we calculate the number of civilizations in our galaxy. How many stars are there in our galaxy that are capable of having planets that are like the Earth? How many of those stars do have planets like Earth? On how many of those Earth-like planets did life actually develop, and so on. If you're an optimist, you find that there are lots and lots of intelligent, communicating civilizations in our Milky Way galaxy. If you're a pessimist, however, you can easily find that only one in a million galaxies, like ours, might have intelligence. So if you're a pessimist, we may well be the only ones in our Milky Way galaxy. If a massive and malevolent alien force heads our way, what is Earth's best defense? One of the things that saves us is space travel is slow. We'll have warning that they're coming. We'll see them with probably many days warning as they pass through the solar system looking like a, another giant asteroid or comet coming in from the outer solar system. As they get here, the question is, what do they do? Are they really the Independence Day aliens that come in and sit over our major cities and threaten all life as we know it? Or do they simply land and offer us their books and their medicine? If it becomes a street fight, perhaps Earth will be saved using weapons inspired by science fiction. from Luke Skywalker's elegant lightsaber to the laser guns used in a thousand Saturday matinees, there's no shortage of handheld weapons in sci-fi. Weaponry in science fiction for years has had some sort of stun setting. The phasers in Star Trek, the staple guns in Space 1999 will render somebody unconscious but, but not kill them. Technology today is getting better at that sort of thing. Inspired by science fiction, weapons researchers continue to develop a variety of ways to affect someone's behavior without blowing a hole through them using a crude projectile. The U.S. military have developed the active denial system, a system designed to elicit the goodbye effect. What this is is a huge microwave transmitter. You shoot this to disperse crowds. People literally feel like their skin's on fire and they say, goodbye. Other military projects harness the power of electricity, building on taser technology to deliver a non-lethal jolt. A simple phenomenon such as electricity, of course, is science fact. One that has sparked many ideas in science fiction, including providing the power for one of the most famous time machines ever built. Have your 1.21 gigawatt standing by, fire up the flux capacitor, and get ready to take a trip back in time. <laughs> <laughs>